In this podcast, Jim Harter, chief scientist from Gallup, talks about data-driven perspective of a good manager. So, stay tuned. Welcome everyone to uh, Work to Dot O podcast. Today we have with us a fascinating guest, uh, and I think very few time we have an opportunity to meet someone who. um is working on this idea of future of work on a on a data level and we have jim harter he is a chief scientist at workplace for gallup uh, a brief bio he is a co-author of it's the manager uh, by published by gallup press on may 7th uh, uh, 2019 he has led more than 1000 studies of workplace effectiveness including the largest ongoing meta analysis of human potential and business unit performance the best selling author of 12 uh, the elements of great managing and well being and the five essential elements harter has also published articles in many prominent business and academic journal with that jim welcome to the podcast thanks vishal great to be with you today thank you so much so before we get to the the meat of the stuff uh, discussing the book and and your journey and sort of what led to this book let's talk about your background like what 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 brought it to this point well i uh growing up i i guess i always uh got good feedback that i could write reasonably well and that uh i was good with math and i knew uh, growing up also that uh i like just studying people uh, mm-hmm. now i didn't know this career that i'm in now it really existed back then so i mm-hmm. i got into business school and um got really fortunate along the way and had an internship at a company called Selection Research that ended up merging or acquiring Gallup and taking on the name Gallup uh, blending the polling science with the uh, uh, deep analytics around human resources and organizations and um so i had a chance to work with a lot of really good mentors over the years that had a big influence on me um don i worked with don clifton um who's uh, the american psychological association um named the uh, father of strength based psychology i worked mm-hmm. with him for 17 years and he had a big influence because he he uh had a philosophy that you can learn a lot by studying what's right with people mm-hmm. and uh, what leads to success which is a little little different than historical psychology had been at that time um studying you know what's wrong both are important sides of the coin but um he decided to focus his entire career on that and then i also had a chance to work uh, real closely with Now, Frank Schmidt at Iowa. We published a lot together over the years. Mm-hmm. He taught me the techniques of meta analysis, which I was able to uh, utilize. Our whole team was to understand whether there's some generalizable traits that apply across organizations instead of just reinventing the wheel with every organization. Are there some elements that we can, some elements of human nature that we can leverage in organizations? Also, I had a chance to work with uh, Danny Kahneman. Um, he had a big influence on me in terms of thinking about. Uh, the two two parts of our brain the the part that uh, thinks slow and the part that thinks fast he wrote a fascinating book on that uh, topic um Arthur Stone on momentary measurement Angus Deaton on um his view on economics has been influential to me he's done so much great work in that area also a nobel prize winner um a, lo- a lot of really good I could keep going on mentors there there've been a lot of them in, in my time but uh um and the team that i work with also has had a big influence on my ability just to um get a lot done i think i mean you know we've we've had uh just churned out a lot of different research studies but really tried to focus those studies on areas that we could apply uh in organizations so that's kind of been our filter has been let's let's do research that uh, we can kind of synthesize into into ways organizations can make a difference um so i'll stop there i don't want to go too long on that part Sure. So I think it's um by the way fascinating name dropping. I think I, I let like talking to these people for half an hour or a coffee chat would be enough let alone uh, working with them and 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 learning from them. I think that's truly truly fascinating. So tell us um to our our listeners and viewers what does Gallup do? So we're a um 
an analytics and advice company, if you really are going to boil it down. A lot of people know about us through our polling work, which we do globally. We have the only uh, global poll uh, with representative samples all over the world. Um, so our history, people know from George Gallup's work in, in polling, but um, more regularly what we do is, is deep analytics inside organizations, uh, advice, analytics driven by um, by data that we collect in organizations and uh, attach learning to that as well. So our goal is to create a change, to change cultures in organizations. We think that's our best chance to change society is through, through organizations. Interesting. And, and what has been, um, like, uh, tell us your day-to-day -day activity. Like what, what does you work on and what, what's your typical day in your life as a chief scientist at Workplace for Gallup looks like? Yeah, the, the, the days vary somewhat. Um, I would put my work into two different categories of things that I do if I were going to be real general. Uh, one, one is uh, working with our team on the, the research studies that we're involved in, thinking about the future and what's going to be most important to organizations. We utilize a lot of listening posts to figure out you know, what we ought to be focusing on next. But uh, so half of my job is, is, is really spending a lot of time going deep into the data. Um, and uh, in formalizing these research studies. But the other side of it is the communication of what we learned. And mm -hmm. that happens either through articles, um, short articles, um, books, uh, longer, more academic type articles and, and presentations, of course. So um, one side is the analytic side. The other side is the, is the communication. And that's both internal at Gallup and external. Um, with the goal that we can take some of these insights and apply them in a, in a functional manner. Interesting. So Gallup plays with enormous amount of data, right? So, and, and you have access to like a um, lot of those repositories. So I, I always wonder like, so when are you, um, what is the process of designing a research report? So if suppose like, how does that, what is the workflow of when you said, because you could easily be, um uh, diluted in a lot of these data and and just like pretty much be be stuck with it how do you end up deciding what reports to publish and 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 what like walk us through that journey yeah the uh the, the enormous size of the data sets can paralyze you a bit mm -hmm. <laughs> so um we uh we really try to focus in on uh, areas that align with what organizations are most concerned with. And so we have listening posts to, to do that. And so we're continuously writing articles, um, short and long, that align with those interests, you know, whether it's on uh, the future trends in the workplace, um, hiring and developing uh, millennials and Gen, Gen Zers, uh, or whether it's thinking about inclusivity, diversity in organizations, uh, whether it's thinking about innovation, um, agility, that's a, been a hot topic recently. So uh, we, we try to uh, stay really close to what organizations are concerned with um, through a lot of different avenues. Um, we have a guy that, that does a round table with our CHR, with CHROs all over the world and so that's one source, but we also listen to um, external sources and what they're saying are, are the areas of, of, of top interest. And, uh, you know, we listen to our own clients and th that we work with, organizations that we're working with uh, personally. So th the workflow really is we're in the short term developing articles and perspectives mm -hmm. on these key issues that organizations are focused in on. And then periodically we'll produce a state of report. We call them like the state of the global workplace, uh, state of the American workplace, where we're um, summarizing those findings. In a, it's a bit of a thicker report, but it gives an overall kind of let's let's slow down for a while and let's take a look at where we're at before we move forward. And so uh, those state of reports kind of give us a chance to settle in on where we're at in, in the current workplace, workplaces around the world, and then what organizations can do about it. So it always kind of, uh, the perspective always includes insights uh, in what uh, we found organizations can act on to create some change. And most organizations nowadays want know that they've got to change their culture. Um, one of our uh, recent insights is that changing a culture from a culture of boss to a culture of coach mm. um, will get organizations all, a long ways down the road in terms of aligning with 
uh, this newer workforce and what they're looking for. We'll be back after a short break. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Tao.ai, world's first AI-powered platform to build enterprise success network. Learn more at Tao.ai. Let's go back. Interesting. And and one thing I, I'm, I'm uh, curious to learn about is I think you have spent a lot of time, a um, couple of decades, in, in seeing this industry grow around how the organizations uh, are evolving, right? From your vantage point, uh, as in like thinking from the analyst point of view of how the industry is evolving, uh, like what are some of the insights or some of the some of the things that you have observed uh, companies are evolving as? Like whatever you can share about that. Well, in, from a uh, in terms of what the workforce expects, uh, there are certainly changes that we've seen over time. Um, I've been in this work for about three and a half decades. And uh, what the workforce expects is quite a bit different than what we saw in the past. Whereas in the past, we might have come to work and separated work from life. Uh, work mm-hmm. is a job. We've got a boss who's going to delegate to us and um, uh, help us know what, you know what they expect of us, but, but also more of an, in a delegation kind of fashion. We're going to get an annual review that tells us how well we did. Um, we're going to probably even have a boss that that fixates on our weaknesses and and thinks and almost becomes an expert on what's wrong with us. Um, and uh, so that jo- that job life part is a bit more separate. In this newer mm-hmm. workforce, what they're expecting is something that actually has been good for workforces forever. And the best practice workforces have have always done this. There just aren't enough of them. And so organizations aren't as aligned with this newer workforce as they could be. And this is a workforce that wants to see their purpose. Um, it's not just a paycheck. Paycheck is still important to everybody, um, mm. but they want to see how their work connects to a bigger purpose. Um, they want to see how their work is going to contribute to their career development. The, the number one reason people change jobs right now is uh, career growth and, and development. Um, and it's by far the number one reason. And so, uh, while people are changing jobs more quickly, unfortunately, they're changing companies when they change jobs. So they're not seeing what their path is in the same organization. That's a problem. Um, I mentioned the boss to coach shift. That's a mm. difference in what uh, people expect from work. They want a coach who encourages them, gets to know them individual, individually, gets to know their strengths builds on their strengths to develop the right kinds of skills in an individual way and helps them see what their future is in the organization. So that ongoing kind of continuous coaching um, is something that, that the workforce expects. And they want that also with accountability, interestingly. People mm. people aren't coming to work saying, I don't want to be held accountable. Um, accountability is a big part of that. And, and the people can, people can shine in their current work if they have high accountability. And uh, people are well aware now that uh, that work and life are more blended than ever. This is mm. probably has a lot to do with technology, but we carry our work around with us a lot. And whether we want to separate it or not, it's very difficult to do that. So there's a trade-off, I think, that the, the worker today expects if they're going to be carrying their work around on that iPhone or whatever type of device they have. Um, they, they expect some flexibility. And uh, that's the number one benefit that that workers want from a workforce now is is some sort of flexibility that kind of speaks to the human need for autonomy which has mm. always been there but now we have workplaces that can actually offer that and there's that trade-off that's expected i think um, more than it has in the past so those are kind of some of the cultural mm. shifts in terms of what um, a workforce wants like i said earlier uh, these things i just listed have been prevalent in um, great workplaces for mm. a for a long time, there just aren't, it just hasn't happened enough. And, and now there's an awareness among the workforce that they can actually have those things and that they'll benefit them in their lives. Interesting. And, and, and from your vantage point, from Gallup's vantage point, how do you see, say, uh, temp workers or this gig workers? Like how, um, how real are they from, from uh, like defining the culture of an organization and how real are they when you're doing a research and understanding that okay they have a role to play in the culture of a culture of an organization like what's your take on that well there's some debate out there about whether the percentage of gig workers has uh, increased or not it's probably increased a little bit by our counting of it um, probably uh, the thing to think about 
gig workers is uh, whether it fills a need, you know, within the organization that can't be more economically filled in other ways mm-hmm. through through permanent employees. Um, many people are looking for gig work outside of their normal job. So a lot of people want uh, some type of a gig that supplements their current job. So there's there, there's a lot of that. The, the gig workers that uh, um, are most highly engaged tend to be the older gig workers. Probably again coming mm-hmm. back to autonomy, they they're they're picking a gig that that fits into uh, a choice that they made and uh, fits into a lifestyle that they're uh, trying to build. Um, so I, I think uh, I think there's certainly a, a I think or, what organizations need to understand or need to figure out though is, is whether um, gig jobs uh, fulfill uh, and they're going to be competing against gig workers mm-hmm. that are taking other jobs anyway. So they got to kind of figure out whether these gig jobs can supplement the work that's going on in their organization now or um, or uh, or not, you know, maybe that maybe that maybe their current work can be more uh, economically um, accomplished through permanent employees. Um, there's there's some legal ramifications around gig work as well that I think need to be con- considered. So, um, you know, can you offer them benefits? You know, are they considered um the same as a full-time employee or not. And, and we know they're not late, you know, from a legal mm-hmm. perspective, there's some differences there that, that organizations need to wrestle around with as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the end, you know, I guess my, my general perspective is if they're doing work for you, they've got mm-hmm. basic human needs. If they're, if they're going to do, be doing work um, for your organization, they've got basic human needs like anybody else does from that work, including um, probably a need to develop a need to see, to, to know how mm-hmm. well they're doing. Um, to align with the purpose. And so I, I think that there are some basics that are still really important, whether they're they're gig or permanent employees. Interesting. And now, now let's spend uh, some time on this, this book, uh, It's the Manager. So tell us what it takes to, it's a ginormous project, like to understand, right? So manager, uh, it, it, it's, and you said it's one of the longest studies. So tell us the background behind this book. Well, we, we do have a changing workplace now. Um, we've got, you mentioned, uh, you know, more gig work. We've got um, higher levels of diversity. The, the millennial generation uh, has about double the diversity um, in comparison to the baby boomer generation, for instance. Um, there's more remote working uh, in organizations now. Uh, teams are more matrixed than uh, than ever before and so people are working on multiple teams oftentimes with multiple team leaders um, we know there's there's more digitization in organizations uh, mobile technologies influenced our work uh, more organizations are or endorsing flex time and so with all this it makes the role of managing even more complex than ever before so the the, the job of managing is 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 actually more important than it's been in the past uh, we've also seen in aggregate, even though there have been kind of some upswings lately, that over the dec- recent decades there's been declines in global productivity. Organizations haven't been nearly as efficient as they could be with human capital. I think they've done a lot in terms of process efficiency, but the human efficiency part has a lot uh, left to be desired. And um, But the good news is there have been big advances in the science of management, but the practice of management hasn't kept up with the advances in the science of management. And that's evidenced by um, the percentage of people who are engaged globally, about 15% um, are engaged in their work, involved in enthusiastic in, in, about their work um, globally, 34% in the US. Now, granted, those numbers have improved a little bit over mm-hmm. the years. So there, there's an upward trend and uh, more organizations are aware with what they need to do, but it's still uh, much too low to be operating at 15% efficiency is, is not where we wanna be. Uh, again, the good news, though, is organizations uh, that have done the right kinds of things have moved that 15 up to up to uh, 70. Now, many of them started above the 15 to get there, but some of them were close to 15 when they started and moved it up to 70 plus. When you're operating at 70 plus percent efficiency with mm-hmm. human capital, you're doing really well. Um, and so there are ways to get there. And uh, so that's the encouraging part of it. Uh, you know, the overall numbers can get a lot better and there are ways to do that. Uh, but the key is that organizations nowadays need to align their practices of management with the demands of the new workforce if they want to attract them in an effective manner. So uh, I'll, I'll kind of stop there, but there's a, there's a lot that goes into what I just said. 
Okay. And and, and typically, um, walk us through a bunch of research um, that went into this this book. Like, uh, explain some of the research that you did and what did you find that end up making into the book. We'll be back after a short break. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Taudot AI, world's first AI-powered platform to build yeah. enterprise success network. Learn more at Taudot AI. Let's go back. Well, one one piece of research includes uh, uh, surveys of 40 million employees in uh, thousands of organizations around the world, and that's about 4 million work teams. So th- these are data that are mapped all the way down to the team within organizations. So these are deep dives in organizations where we're understanding variability that exists within an organization across those teams, along with performance data. In, in many cases, we're able to track uh, trends on how engaged workers are with with um, uh, with the performance that they that they achieve, and we've been able to do that across different uh, economic times, which is uh, which is an advantage. So, since we've been doing this work for a couple of decades, we've been able to. Uh, well, actually, Gallup goes back much further than that, but in terms of the tracking mm-hmm. those forty million, that's been a couple of decades now. So that that gives us a chance to to see how things change as all the changes we've seen have happened, like all the technological changes and changes in the economy that have occurred. Um, so that's one one segment of data is that we got another uh, set of data around uh, the traits that people have once they join organizations. Um, this both comes from uh, research we've done pre-hire where we've studied the traits that lead to success in different jobs, and then. Um, post-hire looking at uh, the strengths of individuals after they've been hired so that organizations can leverage those strengths. That's about about 20 million in the strengths database and then another uh, another 20 million or so in that, um, in that uh, database around selecting uh, employees for the right job. So these are, you know, big sets of data that allow us mm-hmm. to, to test whether there are generalizable patterns that work across different organizations and also to look at different uniquenesses and also to look at changes that have happened that have occurred in uh, the profile that it takes to be successful for, for instance, for example, managers, Um, Mm. you know, what it takes for a manager to be successful versus not and how that's changed over time. Interesting. And, and you guys are global, so you guys are everywhere, right? So, and, and when you talk about say manager, manager has a lot of, environment uh, construct are tagged to him or her so which culture they belong to their geoloco the company type the mm-hmm. industry type there are a lot of sort of um, secondary parameters that are used to define what a good manager or a bad manager looks like in an organization mm-hmm. when you're doing a research like how can you generalize uh, and what goes into um, creating the, the the generic framework that that we all could sort of somehow fit in as managers, like what what goes goes behind that that psychology? Yeah, so uh, we we uh, as a psychometricians, so we, we ask questions and we listen to what people say and we categorize responses uh, to those questions. But we we key it all off on what um, on success criteria. So we know that managers manage toward a lot of different outcomes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they, they manage toward uh, retention rates. They manage toward people showing up to work. Um, they manage toward productivity outcomes. Uh, they manage toward keeping uh, customers loyal uh, and engaged. Uh, they they manage toward uh, high profitability, which is driven by quality of work and efficiency. And um, and so there's a whole host. Sa- Safety is another one that they manage toward if they if if it's a an organization that tracks accidents. And so um, we look at the outcomes of, of successful managing from a macro perspective, knowing that uh, we've got to consider all these outcomes. So when you think about um, multiple outcomes that managers are responsible for, our goal is to understand what traits predict those successful mm-hmm. outcomes. And we found that there are there are five general traits in managers that predict success across industries and across um, different cultural um criteria or regions of the world. So um, I, I can kind of go through those for you if, if yes, you'd like, sure. just to kind of give give the folks some idea about what we learned. Um, one is uh, they're, they're really 
effective in terms of motivating others, inspiring teams to get exceptional work done. Uh, there, there are some individuals that are naturally much better at that than others, and that's a that's a trait that you can select for. Um, there, the second is what we call work style. They set goals and arrange resources for the team to excel. So they're they're really good at at setting goals and and uh, getting people aligned and organized. Um, the, the third is we call initiation, and so that's influencing others to act, pushing through adversity. Uh, every team will face adversity at some some point in time. Can they can they push through that resistance and get the team to excel despite that? Sometimes it's a down economy. Sometimes it's mm. a competitor coming into the area. Um, it it could be any number of any number of things that influence a business as time goes on. Uh, the fourth really important collaboration. That's how they build committed teams and deep bonds within the teams to excel. So the, that relationship component is really important. And, and that includes a kind of a natural ability to see the differences in others and leverage those differences. So, you know, a, a leader might say, well, how do we, you know, how do we build a system where each individual and their needs are, are taken into account? It seems impossible. If you have great managers in place, they do that for you. Mm -hmm. They naturally do that for you. The, f the fifth area we call thought process, and that's uh, taking an analytical approach to strategy and decision making. That's one of them that has become even more important over the recent decades, probably because of the influx of so much information coming at us, data, uh, technology, that managers have to have to account for a lot more information than in the past. Uh, another area that has uh, changed in terms of the demands of, of managers over the years has been uh, just a more collaborative involvement in, in goal setting and, um, and getting things done. It's a much mm -hmm. uh, greater collaborative type uh, managerial process now than in the past, even though the relationship component has always been important, um, a bit more on the delegation side in the past, and that was accepted. Um, now uh, this workforce wants to be a part of it, and uh, managers, uh, successful managers are much better at collaborating, getting input from people who are close mm -hmm. to the action probably has something to do with that thought process component too because they've got to they there's no way a manager can know everything they need to um to, to make the right decisions without ongoing communication and collaboration with the people they work with interesting and and what is um like what are some of the main uh, or, or or sort of um out of these five which one do you think you can train or you can be coached in so, and what are some of the things that, that it's very difficult or which, which one is, is the easier fix out of, out of these five? Is yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So in psychology, everything we measure pretty much exists on a continuum, right? You've got, mm. um, you've got traits that are more hardwired on one end and you've got more malleable characteristics on the other end. The more malleable ones tend to be um, setting, setting, you know, or engagement type elements. So setting clear expectations, you can change that in somebody. You can, you can clarify things for them. Um, how well they work with others, you can do something about. And whether they feel cared about, you can influence. That's changeable. Um, whether uh, they feel connected to the purpose and mission of the organization, you can do something about that. That's, that's all changeable. Um, the traits I listed are less changeable, but there's, you know, there, there's still, there are shortcuts to, to influencing some of them. So um, nothing we measure is completely unchangeable, right? But you, mm. you, as, a, as a leader, you want to you wanna leverage the parts that are less changeable to affect the parts you can change, right? So you, you got to know what those two are first. Um, I would say the collaboration part is changeable, um, even though some people are better collaborators than others and have, have some much more natural insights about ma managing the complexity of others we can help them with some shortcuts we've mm -hmm. one of them we developed is a strengths-based approach where in a short period of time you can get to know someone really well and put some language around their strengths and if you start with their strengths you can build successful individuals much more effectively by putting giving them the right skills so it and that point i made earlier about how can you individualize to this these big masses of people one is you can if you have a good measurement based approach based in science, you can give the, give each individual insights and some language around what their strengths are. The manager can know that and they can be much more effective at managing that person and collaborating with them and helping them collaborate with their coworkers Interesting. more effectively. Interesting. So th that's, that's one, I think, um, you know, motivating people 
is another one and um, that uh, people can get better at that if they first know the individual and know what their aspirations and goals are. And uh, but again, some people are just going to be better at that naturally than others, but we can give managers shortcuts to, to be much better. We'll be back after a short break. This part of the podcast is sponsored by Dowdod AI, world's first AI powered platform to build enterprise success network. Learn more at Dowdod AI. Let's go back. Interesting. And, and uh, from, from, from this research, right? So, um, what is, uh, uh, what is a definition of a hallmark company that fits into this mold of doing everything right? So, in your survey, did you did you sort of map up any particular example of any company out there that's that's sort of mimicking the idealist persona that this report is generating? We um, we spend a lot of time in this writing intentionally, um, not. Um, going after anecdotes as much as we went after general findings that work across organizations. So that meant that we pooled data mm-hmm. from uh, a lot of successful organizations. But I can tell you what some of the patterns were that were consistent mm-hmm. across those organizations. So for instance, when I talked about moving from really low levels of engagement to high levels of engagement, um, there's some basic principles that these organizations followed in getting there. So how do you get to culture change? Well, one, you've got to have um, it part of your kind of DNA as an organization to value people and to value the development of people as part of your leadership DNA and as part of this is what we uh, it's part of our purpose as an organization as part of our strategy and so it isn't just a a, it isn't a, a survey that exists in HR that happens once a year it's a continuous part of, of what our culture is about. And, and so there are some strong statements said by leadership that they get people on board and know that it's part of their accountability system. Um, so there's that strategic approach that's really important um, to changing a culture. And it's got to start with the CEO, even the board in many cases, um, and, and the executive committee. Um, second, there's got to be really good communication inside the organization mm-hmm. so that people know what's happening and why. Um, they don't they don't think of, of activities that exist as in silos or in, in, in programs per se as much as they're part of how, how you do things around here. Um, so they're, they're, there's clear communication about what's happening and when. Um, third, there are uh, really good performance management and development uh, processes that align with the concepts that are included in a high development organization. This includes um, setting clear expectations, um, ongoing conversations that happen and, and how you can how you can make those happen and, and, and why they're important so people know that the ongoing conversations are, are part of uh, the job of managing and and, and third and, and I guess the, for, the fourth area related to all this is accountability but on that third one it's important that both performance management programs and learning and development programs aren't separate kind of siloed activities but they integrate those concepts of a highly engaged high development organization inside of them so that it doesn't feel like a separate thing to managers who are being trained. And then that, that fourth one, again, is accountability. They've got a system where managers know um, that developing people is part of their job and uh, part of their responsibility. And if they don't do that effectively over you know a certain period of time, they've got plenty of time to work on it. But if they're not effective at it um, over time, then uh, the, the organization's got to take their job as a manager um, and, and what their role is in the organization pretty seriously because of all the lives that they're impacting. So there's uh, there are definitely patterns to how organizations get uh, to high levels of success across organizations. Now, that said, organizations do all those things in their own way, mm-hmm. right? So they, they, they reach those outcomes, but they do it in a way that's culturally appropriate for, for, for their organization. Interesting. And, and what, what were some of the big surprises that were uncovered when, while, while writing this book? That, that your personal um, surprises that you thought, but it ended up becoming the different? Yeah, probably the biggest surprise to me was um, the actual experience of the manager. And the reason it's a pretty important surprise to do something about is that if managers themselves um, aren't developing then it's going to be very difficult 
for those managers to naturally reach out to other managers and other teams and cooperate with them and to develop their own employees. So for example, managers in general have more stress than the people that they manage directly. Mm. They have less clear expectations than the people they manage directly. Only about 30% of managers can strongly agree that someone encourages their development. Um, I'd argue if, if we don't get those things fixed, our chances of changing a culture are pretty low. It surprised me that uh, it was that low. You know, we know that managers have more autonomy when mm. they get into those roles. Um, certainly, they have more autonomy. Um, they, uh, but um, if they have autonomy and they they feel stressed out and they don't feel like they're developing, um, your ability to get things done across teams is really in jeopardy. And I think that's what a lot of organizations are struggling with right now. They've got a lot of great initiatives, but those initiatives aren't taking hold as quickly as they need to. To, to do things in an agile kind of way. And the key is, is, is the manager and how we develop those managers and how we set the right expectations for them in terms of their roles. And there's a lot, again, that goes into that. It starts mm. with, um, you know, really um, in, the, in the job demands that we mm. set for managers. So we've got to expect that their job is in part developing people. It's not just delegation, it's coaching. So we've got to set that expectation first. Um, second, we've got to have uh, the curriculum in place that's continuous, that isn't just episodic, but it's, it's a continuous curriculum where, that, where they have some base concepts mm -hmm. that are foundationally in human nature. They learn some things about human nature that they can apply, strengths, clarity of expectations, um, the right kinds of conversations, developing people, holding people accountable, and then the curriculum needs to build in a way that's comfortable for for the managers across time so that they don't see, feel like it's a burden it's going to help them be more efficient in their work so the curriculum is really important um, how you uh, how you select managers for the role of manager is important uh, pre-hire mm -hmm. i would argue that should probably be before they even brought into the organization you should know something about their ability to manage others and then you have to give them the right kinds of experiences when they're there to see firsthand how good are they in, in working with teams give them some 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 team uh, experiences so you can see how well they work with others that'll give you some clues about who should be in that role and then we also need to build inside of organizations a way that an individual contributor can reach a really high level of status without being a manager mm -hmm. um, too often people get into the managerial roles uh, because they're really good at an individual contributor role which that's fine if they still are a good manager but many aren't um, and then they, they get kind of um, I guess it'd be Peter principle to, to uh, a managerial role when they could have been an exceptional individual contributor. And then second uh, tenure, they're in the organization for a long period of time. So the right to passage is to be a manager. Interesting. So yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, so I, I was, I was asking that. Um, so when, when you were writing this book, who is the, who is the ideal um, right a reader that you envisioned when you were writing this book? We were originally, our audience, uh, when we started writing this book, was uh, the CHRO and the CEO, executive committee type folks. Um, but as we started writing it more, um, we really figured out that it has some, uh, the, the principles we learned have a lot of appeal to managers at any, any stage in their career in organizations. Maybe even individual contributors would get a lot out of it um, be, because, uh, you know, we have a whole section on uh, that's that area called boss to coach moving from boss to coach that could be picked up by any manager and, and they could do quite a bit with that that section because it gives them some real practical guides in terms of how you move from being a boss to a coach but we start the book with uh, um, strategy and culture change and uh, then we move into a section that that's that's on the employment brand mm -hmm. which is uh really important. It's really about how you build the right employee experience internally so that your brand is reflected externally. Um, right now, what happens inside organizations goes outside of organizations very quickly. Mm. And so you've got to build an authentic employment brand that's aligned with your culture and your strategy. And then the way you get that done really is that boss to coach piece. And then we have a whole section on the future of work as well. But the audience started off being that executive level and um, it's uh, transitioned to be much broader than that. Interesting. And and one thing I found, I found very fascinating or actually very unique about this book is how it is laid out, right? So I think there are 
lots and lots of chapters and each 52. chapter is variable 50 yeah it's it's like uh, this is one of the very unique style and then the book has an appendix which is almost the same size as the book right so and each chapter is like what what sort of uh, motivated you to design this book in in such a way or write the book in such a way well we 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 thought about the book as as kind of a resource book a kind of a handbook right so you could go through the the chapters at the beginning of the book laid out into those five sections and it's, we know that organizations are going to be at different stages in the revolution and so uh, our hope was that you could go to any chapter independently um you and your team read through it and have a discussion about it so you could read through a chapter it's a page page or two most of them um uh, read through it very quickly and have a discussion about um the overall findings that we present and how you could apply those in your organization uh it's, so it was designed in such a way that it could be used any any chapter in the book could be used independently although they are grouped into those sections um some people have that I've talked to have read it all the way through uh, start to finish um so it's up to the individual i guess but we didn't want to make it dependent on that typical start to finish read but rather scan the areas that are of most concern in your organization or even that you you want might want to uh, review some of your strengths mm-hmm. as well in your organization and think about what you're doing right make sure you do a good job of understanding that and why um but find the areas that are most central to you and your organization and have a good discussion about it and i think that's that absolutely i i i think the one part, one thing that i love about how the book is structured is you just can attack that particular section and just get some knowledge quickly and and as you rightly said it just gets a conversation starter so one 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 area where which i found interesting in, in in this book when i when i sort of pick up the book assuming it's from gallup right so i'm assuming stats i'm assuming data that goes behind writing that book but when i'm going through each chapter uh i think what i i was i was looking for are stats charts that 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 navigate me to okay this is what's going on and then definitely the their, their appendix right so you can go back and see where it's coming from and you can find some information there but like i i wonder that you are a statistician like you you come from that 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 sort of the world why you just you mask it out of of this right focus when when you're reading the chapter you can actually get to learn a lot about the stats what's going on yeah that's a that's a great question uh we thought a lot about that we have a few charts in the main text of the of the book but we tried to limit those because we wanted to uh, pull out the general principles from the data uh, knowing that you know many of our audience will want to know what to do um and from my perspective as a scientist i've always tried to screen our work uh according to what individuals can apply right so uh, we we try to we do the deep dives do the heavy lifting we put all that in reports you noted that you know we have a pretty thick section of uh of detailed meta analytic reports in the in the back of the book but the goal is to make the book useful to leaders and practitioners out there and to do that we wanted to bring out the central points that came out of the data um still referencing data throughout but you know what are the central points that anybody could take and apply and uh, so our our goal with any of this work is organizational change we know that's what mm. organizations are looking for they're looking for opportunities to change and get better and most are asking for some type of culture change a more agile organization um a uh, a culture from boss to coach i think many people uh, understand that has to happen so our goal is to 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 frame the book in a way that they could do that most effectively interesting and and what what's next for 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 this particular conversation call it the manager like what what is the next um, plan you have for this book or its sequel or yeah yeah well, we have uh, a whole series of studies going on this year on the the that point i said surprised me about the manager experience um we're di- diving in even deeper into that we we talk about a lot of it in this book but we're um doing studies or even going to try to reconstruct the day of the manager and you know what kinds of things uh, provide the best experience for the manager and which don't um which which kinds of activities and ex- and manager development processes are most effective for them and the people they manage um what kind of background goes into being a successful manager so we're really diving into that from a lot of angles to understand the manager experience that's one big area 
that we'll be you'll be seeing future reports on. Um, so actually, many of the areas in the book have a longer perspective papers um, associated with them. Some are already done, some are in process. So um, there's a lot of a lot of ground to cover in what we uh, to kind of build on top of what we presented in the book. Um, Interesting. Interesting. And um, so thank you uh, for sharing your book's uh, perspective. So uh, before, I think this concludes the book part. So I, I, I want to spend a few minutes on, on your journey to understand where you are coming from. And, and so we ask all of our guests um, to share some of the traits that has helped them shape their success. Like what are some of the traits that has helped you be what you are today? What, what would you attribute those qualities and, 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 and traits to? Well, I mentioned earlier, kind of at the beginning, that I've had some really good mentors that have had a lot of influence on me. So I, th I think uh, um, I think sometimes in life we get lucky and we have to leverage that and put a lot of hard work into er the areas where we're, we're fortunate. And I was fortunate to uh, come across the organization that I did and have some people that supported me. And I worked really hard um, I worked really hard uh, to uh, to pay pay that back, um, so I think that's a, that's a big factor. Uh, but the team that I have a chance to work with is exceptional. Um, they're all very fun, hardworking people. Uh, we we have a good time at work, but we also every one of us uh, digs in deep and, and and works hard, and and we just enjoy the work that we do because we see that it's connected to something, you know, that can possibly benefit society. Um, so, so that that's big. I think connect the other that kind of relates to the other one is the more that um, I've been able to see how our work can do something bigger than just the work itself. Um, that really drives you to do more and more of it, and to really be um, to to really be authentic about how you approach it. That uh, um, there's a lot to do with the truth. We just have to find the truth, and our goal is to to figure that out and to try to understand human nature as best as possible and then help organizations figure out how to apply it. So um, I, I just, I, I get a, I have a lot of fun um, digging into the, the work that we do, but I have this, one of my themes, my strengths is called focus. Um, sometimes that irritates uh, people because I, I get kind of laser focused, <laughs> um, but uh, it uh, it's something that's benefited me as well. And um, I also another one is relator. So I like to, I really like to spend time with the people that I work with, and uh, um, so that that can sometimes disrupt my focus. But it's a good disruption. So that, that's a good balance for me. Interesting. And one more thing I want your perspective on. So whenever I talk to someone who has chief and scientist in their title somehow, that is intriguing, right? So it gives uh, get, it gives those individual great power. Right. And, and you are, you work with Dan Kahneman. So you, how do you keep yourself away from bias? Right. How do you keep yourself when, when you, even you are uh, sort of looked up to when it comes to understanding what's going on and what, where we are heading to having you as a bias for the executive is super critical. Right. And you had the data. So how do you yourself keep uh, yourself out of this bias? Like what, what are some of the things you do? Well, I, th I think first you have to know your strengths and your limitations. Uh, we all have biases, potential biases we carry around with us. So you've got to do what, what you can to correct for those by knowing your limitations and putting the right people around you um, to, to second guess. I, I've got a lot of people on our team. We second guess each other all the time. And I think that's healthy. Uh, so, so there's that. I think you also have to have a, a just a, an ethical foundation about you about doing what's right, mm. and that's always been a part of our organization. Is that uh, it's the one thing you can't do is 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 ever do anything that jeopardizes the brand of the organization from an ethical standpoint. And mm. so, um, I, I just think there's long there's 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 tremendous longevity in just finding the truth and being really authentic about what the truth is. And there's there's a lot of temptations out there like the flavor of the month kinds of you know organizations say well this should this should change just because everything around us has changed well we've stuck to our guns on what the data keeps showing works instead of right. continuously you know uh, we've got an instrument called the q12 people can say well why, why aren't why don't you keep changing these items well we, first we had a million people in the database and we found it and we keep we've studied it nine iterations of meta-analysis and it's still 
you know, it still predicts performance. And so honestly, it, it works. We've got to tell people that, you know, it'd be easy to say, well, we've got something new. Well, we do have a bunch of new items that we um, have in our database that you can leverage. We have hundreds of questions you can leverage. But we need to be authentic to what's real. And when we do that, we can get organizations a lot further down the road. There's longevity in just being real straightforward about that. Uh, the other thing, of course, is data. Um, data can keep us honest. <laughs> uh, we can mm -hmm. check our biases against the data, and we have a lot of data to do that with. Um, so I think there's a lot of there, there's a lot of things I've utilized, uh, but I've always tried to uh, be real authentic to what uh, the research says, um, and also to second guess things a lot, and, and have people around me that second guess things a lot. That's pretty cool, and and thank you for sharing that. And one more, um, your extremely personal take. I, I I want on 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 this this particular concern. So couple of decades ago there was no social media there was no internet we we're not talking to each other we were like living like a, a, a very physical tribe not like not much connection with with the outside tribes anymore right and at that point um, agencies like Gallup it's super critical like they they seep into all these communities fetch data and help understand the global perspective Nowadays we are all connected. Social media knows a lot about a lot about us than than even we knows many times. So, how do you from from your if you wear your your scientist hat or chief scientist hat, how do you see the future of something like Gallup's or Nielsen's? Like what 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 role do you think these organizations will play as they head into this future where, where we all are so connected and then social media know a lot more about us than we do? Like what what is your take on that? Just curious. Yeah, so um, there are a lot more sources of data. Uh, many, you know, in recent years have called it big data, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, we've got to kind of understand what underlies the, you know, the summaries of those data and what the what the strengths and limitations are. In some cases, you can get to pretty accurate reads from less, you know, unobtrusive data, you know, where you're just, you're, you're collecting what happens to be there instead of asking people questions. But yeah. I've also found that um, it's really still hard in most cases to replace a good uh, question and answer, at least right now, in terms of understanding what people are really thinking about. I'm, I think there are advantages to these these masses of, of data that are out there and uh, the, the mining and the, the scraping of, of data because it's, it's out there and we should take a look at it. So to give you an example, um, there are some organizations that um, used uh, data on Twitter, I believe, maybe some other sources as well. I'd have to go back and look at the report, but they estimated the mood of each day of the week with those data. Uh, they they mm -hmm. got pretty close, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of knowing which days have the best moods and which don't. They missed on some of them, um, so it wasn't perfect, but it gave some clues. In our, in our polls, we can actually ask people every day, you know, how, how they feel, and we know mm -hmm. how they feel from, from that, do representative samples. Um, and so we compared the two and, you know, the, the other version, even though it wasn't representative, was pretty close. It missed, missed a bit on like Fridays and, and some of the, and one of the weekend days, I believe, but, but it was, uh, so I think we just need to know what the, we, we can study it and, and document what the limitations are and what the strengths are of different sources of data. Um, uh, you know, g going into organizations and trying to predict performance with, with attitudinal data, um, I still haven't found anything better than a really well-constructed short survey at this point, but I, I think there could be some other alternatives out there in the future. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see. Um, interesting. There's a lot going on now with you know facial recognition software, and um, right now it's not advanced enough in, in different forms of AI. Mm -hmm. It's it's not. I'd argue it's not advanced enough that it can eliminate. Uh, so on on one end, it can mm -hmm. capture a lot of data quickly. On the other end, it can also uh, create biases. Mm -hmm. You know, it can cue on biases, and so we've got to be careful about that. So I think there's there's a lot to learn. Um, I think the the AI field and the the big data fields are still maturing, um, uh, and uh, we we use. Uh, big data all the time from various mm -hmm. sources and are always looking at it. So I, I just think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of potential out there, but um, we've just got to know the strengths and limitations. And you have to really study it to know the strengths and limitations. 
interesting uh, and thank you for, for for helping me understand that and now let's let's um, one thing we ask our, all of our um, guests to share is some of their favorite reads so do you have some books that you would like to share with our listeners and viewers well i i think you know i like to think about the the ones that have really uh i think kind of been seminal works to me personally i think everybody has their own reading that uh, is useful to them. Uh, one seminal book that probably a lot of your audience has already read, but if they haven't, they they should. And that's Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman, where he mm-hmm. summarized most of his life's work. Um, and uh, it's just a great psychology kind of textbook on uh, behavioral economics and uh, fantastic read on the two selves, the uh, system one and system two. I, I enjoyed kind of a related book uh, um, by John Haidt, uh, The Happiness Hypothesis. I thought was was mm. was good and useful, very foundational. He used a great metaphor there of the um, the uh, elephant and the rider um, mm. to signify the cognitive and emotional parts of our brain. Um, I've historically liked reading the work of Maslow, Abram Maslow. He's mm. got a um, a good business reader book that summarizes a lot of his work as related to business. Um, uh, Drucker's work, of course, has been very influential. I, I like going back in time and looking at some of these scholars because uh, uh, it's it's amazing how the discoveries and work from uh, decades ago uh, still rel- very relevant today. Like management by objectives from Drucker. I mean, that's mm. classic work yeah, that kind of got yes. passed over by fads. You know, and it's. <laughs> It's, it's related to a lot of what we need to do with performance management nowadays. Bob Sutton's got a good book on, uh, uh, he's got several good books, but uh, um, uh, The No Asshole Rules is a good one. Uh, so it, it's an it's, uh, interesting look at management. And then I just, one other thing, I guess, I, I've always enjoyed uh, reading uh, books that uh, kind of go through uh, human nature as it's evolved over time. So I, I'm kind of in the middle of this book, Sapiens, right now. I think it's a really good read. Beautiful book, um, yeah. The the work by uh, by um, Wright on uh, evolution of God and uh, the moral animal I thought were really good. Um, mm. So that kind of I, I love books about human nature and how it's evolved because it kind of helps us think about the foundation of of who we are and and how we appeal to human nature in the in a, the modern workplace. Uh, because a lot of you know what's mm. what's going on in our brains now is they're the same brains that have been around for um, thousands of years, and we're just in no, a different con- we're just in a different context now. No, yeah. I think and, and and I think one thing that that I have seen, um, if you are close to data, somehow you you enjoy uh, the philosophical book and and this nature and and evolution books more because you know the numbers, you have seen the stats, and now you're seeing you're curious at how that stats thread into this life. Mm-hmm. It's. I think it's 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 magnetic. So, uh, by the way, thank you so much for sharing 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 your reads. Uh, as a closing remark, uh, this is our last question. So, um, if you want our listeners and viewers to take something away from this conversation, like what would that be? What would be your closing remark to them? Well, I think if if organizations uh, get really focused on changing their culture from boss to coach. So I've mentioned that several times, but if we think about what all goes into changing a culture from boss to coach and we put some practices in place, I think, I think we're going to have a culture change that leads to higher levels of agility um, and all the different outcomes that organizations are looking for. The conduit um, is the manager. The manager explains about 70% of the variance in team engagement, and that's conservatively expressed. So. Um, Moving that culture to align with the new workforce from boss to coach, I think, is the future of work. Interesting. With that, Tim, thank you so much uh, for spending uh, and uh, spending a generous amount of time with us and helping us understand. Um, good luck with the book. I think wish you nothing but success. I will post the link uh, for our listeners and viewers if you want to check out the book. And um, you're always welcome back on the podcast. Hopefully, in your next uh, follow-up write-ups. Uh, love to share with our with our community and thank you so much for your time on this. Thanks for having me on, Vishal. Great being with you. Great questions. Thank you. Uh, I just, I just, I just.
thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. That's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side.